It's Friday, the 24th of July. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with the concessions from U.S. President Barack Obama that the lifting of economic sanctions against Iran will boost its economy while also increasing its ability to finance the Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations. Obama made the comments during an interview with BBC's North American editor, John Sobel. First of all, we've shut off the pathways for Iran getting a nuclear weapon, which was priority number one, uh, because if Iran obtained a nuclear weapon, then they could cause all those same problems that you just listed with the protection of a nuclear bomb and creates much greater strategic challenges for the United States, for Israel, for our Gulf allies, for our European allies. Uh, second, uh, it is true that by definition, in a negotiation on a deal like this, Iran gets something out of it. The sanctions regime that we put in place with the help of the Brits, but also the Chinese and the uh, Russians and others, uh, meant that they had funds that were frozen. They get those funds back. A large portion of those funds are going to have to be used for them to rebuild their economy. That was the mandate that elected Rouhani. And the Supreme Leader is feeling pressure there. Does the IRGC or the Quds Force have more resources? Probably, as the economy in Iran improves. But the challenge that we've had when it comes to Hezbollah, for example, aiming rockets into uh, Israel, uh, is not a shortage of resources. It, Iran's shown itself to be willing, even in the midst of real hardship, to fund what they consider to be strategic priorities. The challenge is us making sure that we've got the interdiction capacity, the intelligence, that we are building a much stronger defense against some of these proxy wars and asymmetric efforts. And we've sent a clear message to the Iranians. We are settling the Iran deal, but we still have a big account that we're going to have to work, hopefully some of it diplomatically, if necessary, uh, some of it militarily. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry continued his own efforts to defend the Iranian nuclear deal in an appearance before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee during its first hearing on the matter. Speaking in an often contentious open-door session, Kerry fought back against accusations from the senators that Washington was tricked by Tehran's negotiators during the final round of the Vienna talks. The top American diplomat insisted that those opposed to the agreement are pushing an unrealistic alternative that he then dismissed as a sort of an unicorn arrangement involving Iran's complete capitulation. For his part, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew said that the nuclear accord doesn't prevent the Obama administration from imposing potential future sanctions against the Islamic Republic over its involvement in terrorism or violations of human rights. From my perspective, Mr. Secretary, um, I'm sorry. Not unlike a hotel guest that leaves only with a hotel bathrobe on his back, I believe you've been fleeced. In the process of being fleeced, what you've really done here is you have turned Iran from being a pariah to now Congress, Congress being a pariah. But the fact is that Iran now has. We all don't like it. But whether we like it or not, Iran has developed experience with a nuclear fuel cycle. They have developed the ability to produce the fissile material for bomb. And we can't bomb that knowledge away. So this is not a question of giving them what they want. I mean, it's a question of how do you hold their program back? How do you dismantle their weapons program? Not their whole program. Let's understand what was really on the table here. We set out to dismantle their ability to be able to build a nuclear weapon. And we've achieved that. We made clear in the negotiations that we retained the ability and we were going to keep in place sanctions on terrorism, on regional destabilization, on human rights violations. In fact, we are not lifting sanctions that are based on those authorities and we're not de-designating entities that were designated for those reasons. We also have made clear we reserve the right to put additional sanctions in place uh, to address concerns about terrorism. 
President Reuven Rivlin said that Iran not only poses a nuclear threat to Israel and the world, but it is also behind the majority of terrorist organizations in the region, including those operating in Gaza, Yemen, Lebanon, and Syria. While speaking during a meeting with his Croatian counterpart, Kolinda Graber Kitorovic, last night, Rivlin also called for direct talks with the Palestinians, insisting that it is the right course of action for Israel. Iran. Uh, it's not only the nuclear weapon, because Iran is threatening uh, the very existence of Israel. And um, while they are really supporting and standing behind the terrorist organization all over, whether it is in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, or even in uh, uh, southern Israel, in uh, Gaza, and in the Sinai Peninsula, and causing a lot of problems uh, to the Egyptians. And U.S. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton stressed that if elected, she would promote a two-state solution as the only way to resolve the ongoing Middle East conflict. Clinton's comments came just hours after United Nations Middle East envoy Nikolai Mladenov told the Security Council that peace talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians are on life support. I do believe it's possible, and I believe it's the only resolution that will work. I think there has to be a negotiated settlement. We have to look for a way to uh, persuade both sides to do more to um, demonstrate unequivocally their commitment to a two-state solution. Uh, and there are steps that both sides can and should make that I would be promoting. So your question is a, is a very important one, and there is no alternative, and I will continue to work for that because I believe it is the best outcome for both Israelis and Palestinians in the region. Syria is continuing to develop chemical weapons. This according to a report in the Wall Street Journal citing international inspectors and Western officials who say that the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad deceived them. The report claims that last year's international mission to remove Syrian chemical munitions failed to curtail the work of scientists in the Arab Republic, allowing them to develop chlorine bombs. The allegations come amid sharp United Nations condemnation of Damascus for the bombing of the civilian population of Zabadani during its capture of the key town from opposition rebels. Hezbollah backed the regime forces in the campaign and reportedly incurred heavy casualties. We get more from IBA's R.A. O'Sullivan. Syrian forces advancing on the city of Zabdani. In control of only about 20% of what was once Syria, forces loyal to President Bashar Assad have been vicious in their fighting to hang on to key cities. A special envoy of the UN for Syria has accused Assad's army, backed by Hezbollah, of indiscriminate death and destruction. He once again calls on the Syrian government to halt the use of crude and indiscriminate weapons, such as barrel bombs, on its own cities. The tough combat has also reportedly led to refusal by Hezbollah recruits to fight in Syria. It certainly is the case that Hezbollah has been paying a very heavy price uh, inside Syria, up to 1,000 fighters killed already. So already you know, more fighters than they lost in the 2006 war uh, against Israel. And Hezbollah really has no choice about this commitment. As a client or proxy uh, of Iran, they absolutely are, are required to be there inside Syria because if they're not there, Bashar Assad is in danger of falling because his main drawback or problem is the lack of reliable manpower. And Hezbollah, to a certain extent, along with other Shia elements backed by Iran, are kind of plugging that gap right now. So their presence is absolutely required, but it does seem like they're paying a very heavy price. There's been this fight for the Kalamun mountain range, of which a fight for Zabadani is, is part, and going on for months now. Hezbollah and the regime have been making progress, but it appears they've been paying a very, very heavy price in terms of men lost. And this report, if indeed it is true, should be seen in that, uh, in that clear, broader context. His leader, Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, recently called Islamic State as evil as Israel in a move to motivate his forces. Nasrallah has been giving uh, an uncharacteristically large amount of speeches, actually, in the last months, which to some degree, I think, indicates how uncomfortable 
the Hezbollah leadership is with this commitment in Syria. They understand that, that you know, parents, so to speak, didn't send their kids to Hezbollah in order to die in Western Syria fighting against fellow Muslims, so to speak. They went there in order to fight against Israel. That's the cause they've been told all about for the last three decades. So undoubtedly there is a, a discontent there. Yeah, and the way in which uh, uh, Nasrallah has been trying to phrase it is to say, well, we haven't forgotten about Israel either or that uh, ISIS is, is as bad as Israel. Sometimes in their propaganda you see the claim that ISIS actually is backed by Israel and that Israel is working together with uh, these uh, takfiris, as they call them. So yeah, this is a very big rhetorical, a very you know determined rhetorical campaign that's underway. I think clearly responding to an, an obvious discomfort that exists amongst at least part of that movement's uh, constituency. Despite the discomfort, Hezbollah can't afford to halt their commitment to Assad's regime, as their fates are totally intertwined. Ari O'Sullivan for IVA News. Turkish fighter jets today carried out airstrikes against Islamic State positions in neighboring Syria. Three F 16s pounded two ISIS headquarters and one assembly point with munitions without crossing into Syrian airspace. Ankara has also agreed to now permit U.S. aircraft to launch airstrikes against the radical insurgents from its territory near the Syrian border, despite previous unwillingness by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to be drawn into the conflict. And meanwhile, police, backed by special forces, launched massive raids targeting Islamic State and Kurdish militants in 13 provinces across Turkey. More than 5,000 officers participated in the overnight crackdown that netted at least 251 suspects. The office of Prime Minister Ahmed Dao Tolu released a statement affirming the government's determination to fight without distinction what it referred to as all terrorist groups. In other regional news, Israel has reportedly given Jordan a fleet of retired Cobra combat jets to help the Hashemite Kingdom combat threats posed by the Islamic State and other terror groups on its own shared borders with Syria and Iraq. A top U.S. official requesting anonymity told Reuters news agency that approximately 16 fighter jets were transferred and that some may have been dismantled by the Jordanians for use as spare parts for other aircraft. Some 60 Cobra gunships manufactured by the Texas-based Bell helicopters given to Israel in the 1980s were decommissioned in 2005 and 13 out of the preferred use for the more powerful Apache helicopters. Both Jordanian and Israeli officials are declining to comment on the deal, as did others at the Pentagon. Turning now to the strong outspoken opposition to the Iranian nuclear deal from top Israeli officials, primarily Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who plans to lobby the U.S. Congress against approving the accord. IBA's Eli Wogelenter asked Times of Israel editor-in-chief David Horovitz about the implications of this effort and whether it's a wise move. I have no idea about the arithmetic. In other words, I don't know if there's any prospect of getting the two-thirds majority that overrides a presidential veto. But I don't blame Netanyahu for trying. I think even if it's not going to work, I think he has to try because I actually think this deal is so wrong-headed and so dangerous and so devastatingly historically problematic that if, even if there's a very small chance, you, you have to do what you can do. And maybe, I mean, it's so bad that maybe in, in, the, in the coming weeks, the flaws start to percolate. I, I have to think it's a very, very small chance when the president is staking his, 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 his presidency, right? This is his landmark foreign policy issue. But it is so wrong. It so misunderstands this regime. Uh, and his own elaborations on it, Obama's own comments on it, the, the notion, I mean, just listen to Khamenei and don't just listen to the... To the, to the one or two minute headlines. Read that whole speech that he gave on Saturday. This is a different worldview. This is a worldview that does not tolerate the freedoms that America and Israel stand for. These people are not going to be changed. And you're cementing them in power, and you're giving them the choice of if and when to go nuclear, whether to break the deal and break out, or stick to the deal and be ready to break out. You're giving them lots of money. You're emboldening them as a regional power. Uh, you're saying they should be a regional power, which, of course, Iran could be, but not this regime. It is so wrong, and therefore, if the Prime Minister of Israel, of little Israel, very, very threatened, but not the only country threatened, thinks that there's some chance that because of his credibility, he can win over enough people to stop this, that's what he has to try to do. And he should continue on this path, even at the risk of further alienating the White House, further damaging the relationship between the United States and Israel? Look, smarter people than me have reached a similar conclusion with, with much more devastating potential consequences than 
than, than me taking a position. You've got APEC, which is, which is the, the pro-Israel lobby, whose whole essence is, is not to be partisan. It's to try to bolster the relationship between Israel and the United States, to try to champion the shared values and the shared interests, right? They're taking on the president because for, for and, and this is an organization, right? This is their whole raison d'etre because for them, evidently, this is an, a remarkably unusual moment. This is not crises as usual. This is not the hype of, oh, American and Israeli relations are in a really bad place. This is a president that is bent on legitimizing this regime. And therefore, you know, at, 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 at what, almost whatever price, one of the assumptions is, you know, that this president, well, I mean, this president is going to be gone. Israel, please God, is going to be here after this president. Maybe Netanyahu can't stop the deal with this president. Maybe he's going to further destroy relations with this president. For 75 years, we've heard the expression never again. And yet, here we are, what seems to be a parallel situation with Chamberlain, Munich, 1938, we are doing the same exact thing over again. It's dangerous to, to, to try to draw historical parallels, but I certainly think this is a historic moment. I certainly think that, and I, if, as seems very likely, this deal goes through, um, I don't even know what happens if, for example, you do defeated in Congress, then what happens? Once to the rest of the P5 plus one, what are they doing? I mean, the French and the Germans are already on their way to Tehran, the deals are being set up. So I'm not sure... They're just sure. about to go booming. Right, I'm not sure. I mean, America might, you know, there's this faint chance that America won't be part of this. It's more than likely that America will be and everybody else is already. So, I, you know, it, it would appear that largely uh, the deal is done. Yes, I think we will come to back, you know, to regard this as a historic turning point for the worse. Firefighters are at this hour battling to extinguish a forest fire that is raging. Uh, broke out a short time ago in the area of Beit Shemesh outside the capital. Over a dozen firefighting crews and six firefighting planes have been dispatched to combat the blaze, which is spreading in the direction of Moshav Eshtaol, north of Beit Shemesh. A fatal car accident this morning near Moshav Paran in the southern Arava region left one person dead and three others seriously injured when the vehicle they were traveling in on Highway 90 overturned. Bystanders managed to extricate the victims, all of whom were in their 20s, out of the vehicle before paramedics arrived at the scene. A male victim was pronounced dead on the spot and the wounded were evacuated by helicopter to hospital. Circumstances of the accident are under investigation. One of the producers of the Academy Award-winning film, Schindler's List, has given his own Oscar to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. Branko Lustig was born in Croatia and accompanied by visiting President Graberg Kitorovich during a moving presentation ceremony in Jerusalem. The 83-year-old survivor of the Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen concentration camps lost most of his family in the Holocaust. After the Second War, he began a film career in Zagreb and later worked with director Steven Spielberg to tell the story of how German industrialist Oskar Schindler saved 1,200 Jews from extermination. Lustig said that he believes that Israel's Holocaust Memorial is the proper resting place for his Academy Award. I'm very honored. And I think that's a good end for the Oscar. And he will feel here very good. I'm not a party. I'm leaving it to the nation. I'm leaving it to the generation they're coming. I just came and I saw early, early in the morning there are already lines to get in. So all these people will see it. And at my home, there was only my wife and my daughter. It means a lot to us. It means that he understands, like many others, that this is a natural center uh, for commemoration and uh, a symbol uh, worldwide, a universal symbol. But this Oscar is also glistering today with the expression of our gratitude and as a beacon of life of the righteous of the nations who have taken the right choice in the times of darkness. Turning to Poland, where a home used by a local family in Rakowka to shelter a Jewish family during the Holocaust has been recognized as a national monument. Two Polish families of the Skaczyli's clan hid the Jews under the floor of their farmhouse kitchen until 1942, when they somehow came to the attention of German troops. 
After refusing to reveal the whereabouts of the Jews, Tenley family members were forced by the Nazis inside a barn that was set on fire, burning them alive. According to witness accounts, an eight-year-old boy who attempted to run away was shot and killed. There is no information about the fate of the Jewish family. The From the Depths Foundation, seeking to preserve the memory of the Holocaust, recently discovered the history of the Rikovka farm and the Scachilli's family, which remained a secret for over 70 years. This site gives us a hope in humanity. This site gives us an understanding of what people can do. This is why it's so important. Who would believe that one person would risk and end up giving their lives to try and help another? The Scochillas family, the Scochillas family knew what they were getting themselves into. They knew the dangers. They understood what could happen. But anyway, they did it. Now turning to the latest shooting attack in the United States where a lone gunman opened fire at a crowded movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana, killing two people and injuring nine others in a hail of bullets before taking his own life. Authorities have yet to identify the 58-year-old white assailant and are still investigating his motives. Witnesses report that some 20 minutes into the showing of the film Trainwreck, the gunman abruptly stood up in the darkness and opened fire. The grisly incident comes almost three years to the day after a similar massacre at a cinema in Aurora, Colorado that claimed the lives of 12 people and injured 70 others. Just this past week, James Holmes was convicted of 165 counts of murder and attempted murder in that attack and now awaits sentencing. And now to news that is out of this world. And NASA scientists using the powerful Kepler telescope have discovered a planet beyond the solar system that is considered to be a close match to the Earth. The orb is approximately 60% larger than our home planet and about 1,400 light years away out in the starry cosmos. While similarly sized planets have been spotted before, this latest one, called the Kepler 452b, is circling a star resembling but older than the Sun at a distance that's about the same as the Earth's orbit. Today we're announcing the discovery of an exoplanet uh, that, as far as we can tell, is a pretty good close cousin uh, to the Earth and our Sun. Um, this is about the closest so far, and I emphasize the so far because the Kepler data set is very rich and the team and the science community has full access to be able to extract you know, future discoveries uh, out of the data set. But today we're announcing the closest tw twin, so to speak, to Earth two, or the Earth 2.0 that we found so far in the data set. In financial news, the shekel today ended the trading week with a mixed performance. And due to the closure of the stock market on Fridays, here's a look at the closing numbers for the week. The IBA weather team tells us that we can expect a slight drop in temperatures tomorrow, but conditions will remain unseasonably hot. Here's the forecast at home and abroad over the next 24 hours. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow, and I'll be back to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a cool evening, and Shabbat Shalom from Jerusalem.